All right, let's go ahead and start today with just a few prayers. Uh, page 73 of the prayer book will begin as usual with reciting this praise to the Buddha. And we'll do this three times in English today, and then we'll go on to do a few more prayers before we begin. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you, the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you, the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you, the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. You can turn the page on 75. We'll continue with the second full verse there. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms in all aspects, with supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous actions, perform only perfect virtuous actions, subdue your mind thoroughly. This is the teaching of the Buddha, a star, a visual aberration, a flame of a lamp, an illusion, a drop of dew or a bubble a dream, a flash of lightning, a cloud. See condition things as such. Through these merits, may sentient beings attain the rank of all seeing, subdue the foe of faults, and be delivered from samsara's ocean, perturbed by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. Then uh, go forward to page 97 or 98. There are two different versions of the prayer book. You're going to find the short mandala offering prayer either at the bottom of 97 or the top of 98. We're just going to do that single verse, which again is about uh, imagining making this vast pure offering, uh, the entire phenomenal world transformed into a beautiful paradise, whatever that means to you. You can use your creative visualization and you're offering it so that all beings can eventually attain that same purified state, kind of experience that same bliss and joy that that embodies. So we'll do that verse in English, then we'll go forward, skipping the next verse uh, to do the offering mantra, idam, guru, ratna, and so on. And then we'll do the refuge in bodhicitta prayer once in English, twice in the Tibetan. This ground anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon, I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Idam guru ratna mandala kam niryata yami. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Sangye Chodang Soki Choknam Ha Jang Chu Bardu Dakni Kyabsu Chi Daki Chunyan Gi Pe Sonam Gi 
Jola Penchir Sangye Drupar Shok Sangye Chodang Soki Chok Namha Jang Chu Bardu Dakni Kyab Suchi Daki Chunyan Gi Pe Sonam Gi Jola Penchir Sangye Drupar Shok Okay, you can set the prayer books aside and we'll do a short meditation then before we begin today's teaching. So just find a good meditation for or meditation posture, one that works for your body. The main element of posture that we generally point out is having the back somewhat straight. So there's a nice uprightness to the body and the head, but then releasing any tension, relaxing into this posture as best as you can. You can close the eyes if you wish, uh, but it's also sometimes useful to keep the eyelids very slightly open allowing a little bit of light in, keeps the mind more alert and awake. But begin to breathe uh, naturally, just try not to control the breath through this breathing meditation, and just begin to pay attention to the breath as you inhale, as you exhale. And there are a variety of ways to do this. You can tune into the general sensation of the body filling up, kind of expanding when we inhale, and then contracting when the exhalation occurs. Or you can pay attention to the point at the tip of the nose where you feel the air coming in and out of the nostrils, kind of keeping that as your anchor, your meditation object. Or you can even focus on a point at the lower, in the lower abdomen, kind of the rising and falling of the lower abdomen as you inhale and exhale. And there are a variety of other ways to work with the breath. And if you have a technique that you already use, feel free to do that. If not, just use one of those. You can certainly count the breaths as well. This is another technique. But we're gonna do a few minutes of silent meditation on the breath just to bring ourselves into this space, to focus the mind a bit more, to try to let go of distractions. But no doubt the mind will get distracted as we're doing our meditation. Suddenly we'll be thinking about things that are on our mind currently, preoccupations we have, plans we're making, remembrances from the past, variety of things that can come in and disturb our meditation. You can also get disturbed or distracted by sounds or other sensations in the body. Whenever you see that the mind's gotten distracted and lost the breath, at that time, the job is to let go of the distraction and return to the breath. So even if you have to do this many times over the next few minutes, it's perfectly fine. We're just training our minds to be a bit more focused, to have greater attention and concentration. So I'll ring the chime and we'll begin the meditation period. After a few minutes in silence, I'll lead you in a short reflection to set our motivation for being here today.
So now let's set our motivation for being here today. And I thought it would be useful to do a short meditation on the kindness of other beings. Recall that His Holiness the Dalai Lama says that in order for us to generate true compassion, there are two elements involved. The first is clearly understanding the way that sentient beings are suffering. At the deepest level, sentient beings are suffering because of the state that they're in, which is identical to the state we find ourselves in, the unenlightened state, the state of continuing to go from life to life, on the wheel of existence, never knowing any true peace or happiness, always under the control of karma and delusions. So if we've studied that topic, we can very easily see how others are in the same boat as ourselves. So that first element of knowing their suffering can be satisfied somewhat easily. The more challenging element to develop deep compassion for all beings is to feel a sense of concern for their welfare, to feel a sense of closeness, that empathy that helps us to identify with their suffering, helps us to feel that we would eventually want to re relieve their suffering, to work on ourselves in order to help them to do that. So therefore, we have to feel close to others. And one of the ways to feel that closeness is to reflect on the kindness of others. So we tend to divide sentient beings into three groups. In the first group, it's easy to see their kindness. These are who we consider to be our friends, the people in our lives who we're very close to already, we do things for them, they do things for us. We do experience that direct and very intentional kindness from them. And it's good to start there, to reflect on the beings in your life. Might be your pets, might be your family members, your friends, coworkers, whoever it is that you spend a lot of time with, even the Sangha here, the community here. People who are very kind to you, who help you in very direct ways. But then the second group of people, we don't feel perhaps quite as much connection to them because we haven't acknowledged the degree to which we benefit from their kindness. And these are the strangers. Strangers, of course, encompass all the beings that we don't have a direct relationship with. This is the larger portion of the beings in this world. But those beings are involved in your welfare in a variety of ways through their efforts, through their kind actions, although they don't intend them to be kind actions towards you in particular, you do experience their kindness. You do experience benefit from the things that they do, such as sew the clothes that you wear, even design them, uh, cut the fabric for them, all the various things that are involved in producing the clothes that you're wearing right now. The food that you ate earlier today didn't come about through entirely your own efforts. Sure, you were able to buy that food through the salary you have and so on. But that food came about through the efforts of many, many beings. The people who tended to that food on the farms and so on, the people who uh, harvested it, who packaged it, who shipped it, who sold it, and so on. Even perhaps some of you had food that was prepared for you. So many people involved in this chain of getting food into your stomach. It's the same for all the things we have in our lives. The houses we live in, the building we're sitting in right now, the chairs that we're sitting on, the cushions. Everything comes about through the kindness of other beings. Without those beings, we wouldn't have all these things in our lives that bring us comfort, that bring us some measure of pleasure, happiness. So reflect on the kindness of these beings, although they don't intend it directly for you, you are benefiting from that. Therefore, it is a kindness. And feel your heart open to those people who are strangers in this world and other beings who are involved in our welfare, animals and so on, who contribute to your welfare.
And then we finally arrive at the most difficult category of beings to work with, the third, which is what we call enemies, challenging people, people who may be involved in harming you, have harmed you, or those that you love. Maybe they're even people with different political views or people doing things in the world that we greatly oppose. Well, how are those beings kind? As we've been discussing in these verses from Shantideva, they are actually an amazing resource for us to use to develop our hearts, to develop our patience, our love, our compassion. We need those difficult people in our lives. They're there to teach us very valuable lessons. And they might even intend unkindness towards us, but we can choose to see it as kindness. We can choose to see it as something that will benefit us. Because with those people in our lives, we then can make great strides in deepening our heart connection to all beings, which is what this motivation of bodhicitta is based on. So just spend a minute or so reflecting on trying to see the kindness of enemies, difficult people in our lives. Can we see that they could actually be very useful for us to help us so we can be of greater benefit to others? And then we go on to the final step of taking all of that and developing a compassionate intention towards all beings. Whether they be friends, enemies, or strangers, they've shown us incredible kindness in this life and of course in countless other lifetimes. Therefore, from that compassion, from that love, we want to develop this strong intention to benefit them, to help them, and to recognize that by developing our own potential, by actually increasing our own wisdom, compassion, and so on, we will be able to help them in much greater ways than we currently can. And by developing our potential to the greatest degree, to the state of Buddhahood, we will then be fully qualified to be able to help all of them to become free from the cycle of existence, to attain the enlightened state themselves. And this is the mind of bodhicitta, the strong intention to become a Buddha for the sake of all of these beings who have shown us incredible kindness and who are suffering just like us. Thanks for your patience in doing a little bit longer meditation today. But I thought it'd be nice just to introduce that concept because we were working in last week's class with this whole idea of when people are really difficult for us. You know, what do we do with that? Of course, in worldly thinking, you retaliate against those people. You do something to harm those people if they've harmed you or those that you love. But this isn't what we want to do on our path. You know, we want to do what we can to make that into an opportunity to develop our qualities to actually enlarge our hearts. So we're working with this little practice. I think each of you have a copy of this on your table. And once more, those of you who are new here today know that you can take this with you. Um, it's on the table because we keep putting them out, but uh, many people have taken them home already and have a copy that they can work with at home. This is a daily practice that was put together by Lama Zopa Rinpoche, who's our spiritual director. And um, we're going through these verses that help us to enlarge our heart, to live our life for others. So we're on page, uh, I'm going to start again on page 11, which is where we have these wonderful verses from this text. It's called uh, Shanti De Shantideva wrote it. Master Shantideva was an 8th century Indian master uh, who wrote the guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life. And there are a number of verses from this that Lama Zopa feels that we should reflect on every day as we start our day 
to generate that strong wish to help others, to serve others, to be a benefit to others, to become wish fulfilling for others. So we went through the first few verses, which really have to do with this idea of practicing the spirit of generosity, even if we're just visualizing. I mean, it's good to be generous where we can. Not, not everyone has you know, the same resources to be able to be generous to the same capacity, but we can practice the mind of giving and even engage in this kind of meditation, being away what we have to others, uh, what we possess becoming uh, kind of transforming into what others need. Uh, but this whole idea is kind of build up that strong wish for whatever we have, our resources, our positive potential, um, the, even our own body to become a benefit to other beings. And then we went on to um, the bottom of page thir of uh, page 11, verse 13 there. And this is this idea that if we've given our body to others, well then, again, we strongly identify with the body. And again, in Buddhist terms, the body isn't the self, but it's a strong kind of marker of who we are, right? We identify people by their bodies. We identify ourselves. Oh, there, there I am in that picture, but based on our body being there. We have this strong attachment to the body. If we practice this method of giving our body away, it's a good way to sort of relinquish a lot of that strong attachment. Verse 13 says, if we've already given that body to all beings to use for their pleasure in this visualization, in this kind of meditation, well then whatever they do, even if they kill me, criticize me, beat me and so forth, I will let them do whatever they like. Strong words, right? Not easy to practice. But I wanted to share you know, some, some teachings and this may not be on um, this particular verse, but I decided I would bring in kind of a, Lama Zopa has a very um, uh, interesting way of approaching things in terms of being, I don't know if hard line is quite the right word, but definitely saying we need to move to this degree. And, and I agree, we do eventually need to move to this degree, but we also need softer approaches sometimes. We also need to make sure that we kind of uh, keep moving and evolving in a way that helps us to eventually reach that goal. And Pema Chodron for me is one of these teachers who always does that, who kind of always gives me a little bit a different perspective that helps me to enlarge my heart perhaps a little bit. And then I can go back to Rinpoche with a new appreciation. <laughs> so, so in verse um, uh, 13 and 14, this is, uh, again, I didn't read 14 or look at 14 yet, but um, this is her commentary on those two. She says, when I first read these verses, I was appalled. I didn't want to consider going this far, nor did I feel it was wise to do so. From a Western perspective, this advice seems to feed right into the self-loathing so prevalent in our culture to kind of put ourselves absolutely down on the ground as a doormat for everyone else, right? You know, that we're there in this most subservient position and, and we're already beating ourselves up in our culture. So this is just adding to that, right? But knowing that Shanti Deva's intention is always to support and encourage us, I looked past my initial aversion and discovered the wisdom of his words. This, I realized, was the approach of the civil rights workers. In order to benefit not only African Americans, but also their oppressors, they were willing to put their bodies and feelings on the line. For the greater good, they entered into dangerous situations. Being the butt of every mockery, which is the translation they have for um, verse 14, you know, making fun of, of us, you know, to hurt us and so on, making fun of our body to hurt us. So being the butt of every mockery was the least of it. They knew they would be beaten, insult and, insulted, and perhaps even killed. This is an example of bodhisattva wisdom and courage. Yet these were just ordinary people, ordinary people who had given birth to the Bodhi heart. These verses describe what many famous Bodhisattvas were willing to go through. People like Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa, Aung San Suu Kyi, and, and Gandhi. It also describes the bravery of countless unsung heroes and heroines. So I, I thought about that, you know, I spent a little time reflecting on what Pema Chodron said, because I'm not always consulting her on some of these things, because I'm trying to follow Rinpoche's words, but we had such a interesting interaction around these verses last week. There were a lot of things that came up for people, but I thought it'd be useful to introduce that idea. Um, if we do think about those people who have put their lives on the line to fight for just causes. Well, if we really think about what we're talking about here in terms of putting your life on the line to enlighten all sentient beings, there's no real difference. I mean, there's a difference occurring in gradation in terms of this is a much huger result at some level than 
fighting for civil rights, but fighting for civil rights is a manifestation of the same mindset, right? Where we see that there's something that needs to be corrected in the world. We see that there's something that needs to be addressed and we are willing to put ourselves on the line to do that. Now, not all of us have the courage to go to those places. Um, I wish Space was here today. Space was one of the people, I don't know if anyone else in the room went down to the South and Alabama, Mississippi, what have you, uh, to help with voting rights and things like that back in the tumultuous 60s. But we have you know, people, examples of that in the world, right? That have people that go to those places, that go to the difficult um, situations and put their lives on the line. Why? Because they believe in the higher purpose. They know that what they are doing there is right and just and good. Well, again, I don't think it's any different when we talk about doing these actions, sacrificing one's life for bodhicitta, <laughs> because we're talking about the highest aim here. The highest aim being the enlightenment of all beings, and of course our own enlightenment so we can accomplish that, so we can help all others in that, to that degree. So I don't know that it's so much different. And I found it really quite comforting to read her words, but it brought a, a real life example into the picture that helps us to see that people do this. They do definitely go into those places where they will be insulted, beaten, criticized, what have you. We don't like to think about receiving that, being on the receiving end of that. But if we're doing it for a just cause, if we're doing it with bodhicitta, with the wish to benefit others, well, you know, there's a very different dynamic going on there. Now, obviously, we don't want people doing these harms. We talked about that last week, right? That's, that is also a sort of bottom line. You don't want people to continue to do negative things in the world. But we have to look at once more all of what the Buddha teaches as to why that is happening. In our current state, are we able to help those beings to change their own minds, to reduce their own delusions, to reduce their negative actions, to stop harming others, and so on? If we really are honest with ourselves, we recognize that we aren't. Most of the time we aren't capable of doing that. So that's why we are doing these bodhicitta exercises. That's why we're talking about bodhicitta and working with these motivations every day is because we need to keep strengthening that motivation to eventually get to the place where we're fully qualified, where we can help others to that degree. So I'm curious if anyone has any other comments on that now that I've shared a little of what Pema Chodron said and if you had any reflections after last week's discussion on this. I think it is important once more, we don't go to that self-loathing place or even, you know, I think Alex brought up self-care. I mean, self-care is an interesting concept, of course, because we have to be careful. It's a tricky balance, right? We don't get to the place where we totally neglect others just to care for ourselves, but we recognize we do have to care for ourselves to a degree to be able to take care of others. This is what bodhicitta is all about, right? You know, you, in order for you to fully care for others, you have to develop yourself. You have to take care of your own mind and reduce your own negative tendencies and develop your qualities and so on. Otherwise, you're gonna be very uh, uh, incapable of doing the full work. You can do some work, obviously. We can all help others to some degree, but to help them to the degree that it would take to change them to make them into a more kind, compassionate person. Most of us don't have that capacity. So I don't know, there were no comments? Everybody, Mark, yeah. Is, is it possible that everybody has this reservoir of bodhicitta? Uh, Mark's question for those, Mark's question for those online, is it, is it possible that everyone has this reservoir of bodhicitta? I kind of like this concept, uh, Chogyam Trungpa, who I, I never knew and came to Buddhism much later after um, uh, he had introduced Buddhism uh, to America as well. Um, he used to talk, apparently, according to Pema Chodron, he used to talk about what he called the soft spot, how we all do have kind of this soft spot within us that is, I don't know, maybe it's comparable to what we call our Buddha nature. It, it's something that we greatly armor though. And you have some people who've armored it to some degree that they don't let much in at all, right? They don't let their heart get affected so much. These are people who become very cruel and engage in often in very harmful activities towards others. And we know of those people from the past and history and even perhaps people living in our times who have such a hardened heart. <laughs> but that hardened heart is not impermeable completely. It can be gotten through, you know? because we all have that soft spot, because we all have that kind of essence of what we call bodhicitta. I wouldn't say we all have bodhicitta at our heart because it is a thought process we have to develop, but we all do have this kind of soft spot, I think. We all do have this, this place that's a place of great connection with others. 
I think I've told this story so many times, but I, I'm going to tell it again because it proves to me that the soft spot exists. But this is the story of Vinnie Ferraro. Uh, many of you have heard of Vinnie. Uh, he was, he is uh, a teacher of Buddhism. Uh, mostly worked, I think, with um, uh, Stephen Levine's son, um, Noah Levine, and his organization, and so on. But anyway, he grew up in Connecticut, in New Haven. His father was a drug dealer, and he started working for his father in dealing drugs. And he started hanging around with a lot of really pretty bad people. And they would go out uh, and beat people up with baseball bats. And the story is, is that on one evening when he was out doing this, they came across this homeless man and they would decide they were going to beat him up with baseball bats. And here's Vinny with this baseball bat over his head, getting ready to hit this man. And the man locks eyes with him and says, please don't do this to me. And Vinny goes, what makes you think I'm not going to do this to you? And he says, because you have the most compassionate eyes I've ever seen. And it's like, uh, he, did, he didn't say he dropped the bat, but I mean, at this point, he couldn't do that. He couldn't hit this man because he heard something from him that awoke in that soft spot that went through that, per, you know, what we think is an impermeable hardened heart. And it, it went right to the core of it and allowed him to see the humanity of that person in front of him and to connect with him at a level that he'd never connected with any of these people he'd beat up with baseball bats before. I mean, pretty powerful story. And of course, he went on from there to totally change his life, following a path of, you know, spirituality and developing his own mind and qualities. And he has pretty compassionate eyes, too, I have to say. I met him one time um, at a teacher conference, not in a real formal way, but just kind of we were all gathered there and I heard his story and I was really quite taken by it. I have no reason to think it's a made up story. I think this happens occasionally when people do get in these predicaments where suddenly something, some catalyst causes you to get in touch with that. But that's really the core of our being. I would say the cruelty he had when he was beating up people with baseball, but that's not the core of his being. That's just there, and Buddha, Buddha would say the same, because of conditions, because of all the things that led to him being that way. And all of that can be dismantled. And this was a powerful example of one little <laughs> incident that caused him to have this very quick dismantling of so much of his cruelty, uh, anger, whatever it was that was driving him. So, so I agree with you. I do think that we do have that at the essence of our being. That's why we feel good when we see acts of kindness. That's why we feel good when we hear about people who do pretty selfless things in the world, right? We, we, we admire that. There's something that shifts in us. And I'm not saying it's across the board that every person is going to have that registration at that time, but they have the, the capacity for that because they do have this soft spot. So I like that teaching from Chogam Trungpa um, about this idea, this concept. And like I said, I don't think it's much different than what we normally call our Buddha nature. Buddha nature says that all those amazing qualities are kind of resonant with our very nature. All of the negative tendencies are opposed to it. They, they don't have a solid ground to stand on. This is why we can achieve liberation and enlightenment is because through the development of wisdom, compassion, and so on, all these other qualities, they become stronger and dismantle all of the negative tendencies and eventually are rid of them. So anyway, any other? Yeah, Judith. I'm, I'm curious how many people in this room have um, been on a walk or a <clears throat> some issue mm -hmm. or gone to, um, I think yesterday there was the women's, women's march yeah, yeah. at the house. Mm -hmm. um, and I started in South Carolina because there were um, Ku Klux Klan members mm -hmm. marching down the middle of the street when mm -hmm. I was in college. Mm -hmm. And I knew from history that wasn't okay. Right. And it was dangerous. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I'm just curious about other people in the room that have stood up for mm -hmm. um, put your body on the line, but maybe didn't think you were going to get killed or hurt. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't know that part. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Maybe it's good. Yeah. But I, I do think we stand up a lot. Yeah. And also mm -hmm. when we tell the truth. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And we can not lose our body but we can lose mm -hmm. our job mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. something that we're doing mm -hmm. thank you Judith, so for I'm sharing that yeah i would guess most people probably get me here 
<laughs> I would say again, you know, each of us probably, or many of us, have 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 marched for various reasons, various causes, things that we feel are important in the world, but. You know, we all share that same kind of sentiment, absolutely, whether or not we put our lives in the line, as you were describing, Judith, and, you know, or not even known that we're putting our lives in our line, but gone out there into what could potentially be a somewhat dangerous situation, you know. Yeah, please, Luz, come on. There's a chair over here on the end, if you'd like to go there. by David. Yeah. Um, so, so I, yeah, I, but it's a, it's a really good point. I'm sorry, Mary? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't see your hand there. Sorry. <laughs> Which is always good to do before you come to the <laughs> uh, One of the interesting points that was made in the talking session when I ran, and one of the comments is that they're really in the looking for a change because people are so often looking for love and belonging. Uh -huh. And for real change to occur, people have to be willing to really put, make that kind of sacrifice. And <laughs> Mm. You look at change as a result of the willingness to start to go that far. Right. And to, to promote change. Yeah. So those online, Mary was sharing, you know, it's something she was hearing earlier this morning on a political show about Iran and how what one of the pundits was saying, you know, that you may not be able to see the change that we would like to in Iran because the people there aren't willing to put their lives on the line to for that change. That's happening in the United States, right? I mean, you know, there's not a lot of people putting their lives on the line in terms of trying to affect change in this country in terms of policies and so on, what's going on around immigration, around many other things. I'm not saying no one's doing it, but not enough people perhaps to have the effect on the, the entire country, you know, or the political system. So, so I think that there's something to be said for that type of mentality, like you're pointing out, of the willingness to go that far for what we know to be right and true and a good principle to uphold. Now we're gonna relate it back to Bodhicitta too in a minute, but let me hear what Anna has to say. Yeah. And yeah. what we hold in our hearts, and whether it's a self righteousness or if it's from a place of compassion. Yeah. For the aggressors as well as for the, the victims. Of exactly. The exactly. So it's what we hold in our hearts. And yeah. That's so critical. Yeah. Yeah. So again, those online, Anna was just sharing that, yeah, the intention is really the key. And so we have to have that compassionate motivation that includes both sides of the fence that doesn't say we're doing it out of some self-righteousness, some uh, indignation towards the perpetrators for having done what they do to the victims and so on. That type of mentality, again, doesn't get us very far. <laughs> it, it doesn't resolve things. It only keeps them kind of in a process of back and forth, you know. So. so. So yeah, I think this is important. And, and when we, we go back to this place of what we get, well, then when we do have those situations, what state of mind are we going to have? That's the whole gist of these types of verses, is if you do end up in a situation like that, and whether you put yourself in it intentionally by going there and you know being in, uh, there's going to be another one of these marches in Virginia, right? that are uh, gonna be potentially very violent and difficult for people. It, you know, to actually go to a place like that and things start happening, how grounded are you in your own intention and motivation? How much are you going to be able to, you know, be in the space of receiving that type of criticism, receiving that the, 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 the animosity, what have you, and be able to keeping things. That's why I think these verses are set out is because they encourage us to push the envelope, to keep going to that place of how far, how far out can I go? How, how big can I make my heart? You know? So I think these are, these are interesting verses when we really spend some time with them. Um, and I hope people see that and not kind of, I, I wasn't getting, the, getting this impression last week, but I hope people don't kind of just run, read through them and you know, don't think about them at all because they seem kind of too crazy, <laughs> you know, appalling even, as, as Pema Chodron said, that we kind of look at them and go, wow, that's not for me. That's not something that I could ever practice. Every one of us could practice this way. It just takes the gradual development of that. You know, what is it like to be with just minor irritations <laughs> and have the mind stay very clear 
the intention stay very pure. Um, so anyway, any other comments on this? I'm glad we had another talk about it. I felt a little weird after last week's class, like I was maybe pushing a little too hard in some ways, but then, yeah, Judy. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And then it's like, I never did that, so it's been a lot of conflict. Right. Right. And I can't change them. And that's, mm -hmm. and you were talking about the soft spot in my heart. And I'm like, you know, this is another, you know, another pretty good one. Mm -hmm. And, but sometimes she does show that soft spot. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, way back then in March, that mm -hmm. you do get coaching often. And like, this is the one. Thank you. Right. And I'm like, wonderful. He's so upset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, good. Thank you for sharing that, Judy. Um, so again, for those online, just Judy's own personal experience around how these teachings are influencing her and helping her to see the soft spot in her mother, which occasionally she does see. I mean, we all have our own kind of people that we, you know, relate to, that we have interactions with who we do find challenging. And it is good to use these teachings in that way. And what's it like to be with them? And with that open heart and, and not have the expectations again. Expectations are a big problem, right? If we go into it thinking everyone is going to be all kind of a mirror of what we are, you know, we got our heart wide open and everything and we want them all to be that way. Well, then give up on that, you know, that's not so likely to happen. <laughs> but if we keep our heart open and everyone else, whatever they're doing, we're okay with it. It's just like, again, we're going to be just like the sun shining rays of love and kindness towards everyone. But whether those people are going to choose to block the rays or, you know, do whatever to get out of the sun, you know, that's their choice. We, we don't have much control over that. Of course, in Buddhism, you know, in this Mahayana tradition, we're, we are aiming to try to influence people in the most positive way. But there are a lot of people who once more, their obscurations are not going to allow us to do that. I mean, even, I always point this out, even in the time of the Buddha, the Buddha, fully enlightened being, you know, very different from me, fully enlightened being, he had his own cousin, David Datu, who could not see his qualities, who was trying to kill him, <laughs> injure him, do everything he could to, you know, get in the way of the Buddha and his activities, ended up causing a whole schism in the Sangha, you know, the whole split that was very traumatic for the people who were involved. I mean, this is in the time of the Buddha. You know, so, hey, folks, you know, we can't change the world, but we change ourselves. And by virtue of that, eventually, the world does change. Yeah, Paul. I was just finishing reading this week, and there was a Buddhist proverb. It was the Sutras and Buddhist text about anger, and it says, I'm drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So Paula was sharing a, a quote she came across. Uh, I think it does have its Buddhist origins of drinking poison, uh, having the mind of anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. So that kind of resentment or feeling of revenge that we carry around with us, it's so easy to have in our world, right? Again, and, and, and the media, everything feeds that kind of us and them mentality, right? We're right, they're wrong. We're right, they're wrong. Therefore, we've got to do everything we can to correct them or whatever. I don't know, again, I mean, it doesn't, doesn't lead to any positive results. With a mind of compassion, love, kindness, you're going to have much better results in the end. In the moment, it may not look very different, you know. <laughs> um, but that's because, again, things do require the, all the various causes and conditions to change. So it's very hard to make things, you know, completely change. But we can change ourselves. This is the one thing we do have control over. And then they got absolute control because once more we see how much we are a product of our own conditioning of the past and how much hard work we have to put into ourselves to change our own minds and our own hearts. But that is what we do have control over in the end. So don't poison yourself with all these negative, you know, thoughts and what have you. You know, feed your yourself with the positive qualities as much as possible to be able to be a manifestation of those in the world. Any other comments on this idea that we've been looking at? Again, it did kind of spill over into verse 14, this idea that, you know, whatever they do, if they make fun of, of, fun of you, you, ridicule you, 
um, since you've given this body to them, why would you, you know, resist all of their kind of negative things by protecting it, by having that kind of mindset that is angrily protecting it? And I'm not saying again, there are times, there are certainly times when you should protect yourself. His Holiness of Dalai Lama, a one quote that he had when someone asked, well, if you're confronted with a, a really um, violent person, an enemy, and you know, they're, they're gonna do something to you, uh, what's the best response? He said, run away. <laughs> <You know? laughs> we don't have to confront everyone we meet, right? We don't have to be with everyone we meet. There's a lot of times we're just exiting from the situation is the best thing involved, right? Because that person stops what they're doing and you don't have any danger of doing something negative in response, right? Instead, you extract yourself from the situation and diffused to some degree, right? But, you know, in our culture, we like to the, the kind of... You know, Western mentality that we do <laughs> Western United States. So we're going to go to war with everything that is at war with us, right? You know, so not good. So then this final bit that we looked at before we went into these last few verses, uh, I will use it to do any virtuous action that doesn't harm and only benefits others. There's an interesting um, change in the interpretation or translation of that verse from, uh, this was the Padma Kar. Uh, uh, translation group that did the translation in Pema Chodron's book. She says here, um, and so let beings do to me whatever does not bring them injury. It's kind of an interesting switch on it, right? Because here the idea is, is, is I will use it to do something, everything that is positive and never harm others. But I will, in this other case, let beings do to me whatever doesn't bring them injury. I mean, it's kind of a, a real switch on it because it does have that once more, that flavor that we were talking about last week that ideally we don't want others to do things to harm us or anyone else, right? <laughs> because it's not good for them. Karmically, it's going to create the causes of their own suffering. You know, but if we confront that type of mind or act behavior with anger, with all these other negative emotions, it's not going to solve it. It's only going to cause us to create more negative karma towards them and them generally to respond in kind with more anger towards us. And it becomes a one-upping on terms of the anger and it just perpetuates. Whereas if we do what we can to keep generating the positive qualities, eventually we will be able to help that person. Again, in the moment, we may not be able to. They may just want to continue their harmful behavior. But ideally, we don't want others to engage in harm. So I found that an interesting little change, a switch in the translation of that. I don't know enough Tibetan, or I guess this was in Sanskrit at one point too, of course. Um, I don't know enough of those languages to know whether they, um, there is the room for that type of translation shift. Sometimes translators get impacted by teachings they've had uh, from various masters that influence the way that they translate a verse. But just know that there are different ways of translating some of these that can be uh, get across different meanings because ideally we also don't want others to do anything with their bodies and their actions that harm them. You know, bodhisattvas, when they practice these types of attitudes, again, they don't ever become entangled. If they, if they have that kind of clear intention and have a, a wealth of practice behind it, they never become entangled with the other person karmically in a negative way. I pointed this out, I don't know if I said this last week, but it said that it's even good to have a negative experience with a highly realized being. Why? Because from their side, there's no, nothing that's going to measure in any harm. They only want to benefit you. While you're harming them with all of your you know, bad language and whatever you're doing, they're only having this mind of compassion, kindness, a wish to benefit you, a wish for you to not suffer. So good being to connect with, even if it's a negative connection. I'm not saying go up to you know, some highly realized Lama and start yelling at them or something. You know, <laughs> have better to have the compassion and the devotion and the you know, whatever for them, you know, all those kinds of positive attitudes. But it's good to have any kind of type, type of connection with these highly realized beings because from their side, they're not wanting to further any type of negative karma with you. They only want something positive with you. And oftentimes they say, if you have that negative interaction, it will come around to ripen into a very positive experience with them. I remember I heard a story from one of the um, uh, students in the master's program where I studied, and, and he had gone to a retreat that Lama Zopa Rinpoche led in, at Vajrapani in, um, I think it was 1997. And he said that there was, he came across, he was going for a walk in the woods, and he came across this one student who had seen Rinpoche, I guess he was out walking, and he was yelling at Rinpoche, like being really, really 
you know, red faced and yelling and all this. And he said it was kind of interesting. He didn't want to watch in some ways because it was kind of painful to see somebody confronting Lama Zopa that way. But he said, he said, as the man just kept doing this, Rinpoche would just stayed in this very soft place. And eventually the person just started crying, you know, because, you know, you're not getting anything back that mirrors that. And instead it starts, it's, you know, you find that soft spot in a sense too. Another example of that, I suppose. So anyway, I don't know why I brought all that in, but you know, this is again, the bodhisattva attitude is one of, I'm here to benefit you. You know, and, and if I have to be the butt of jokes, if I have to be the, the, the receiver of all this harm, I'll, I'll gladly do it, but have that motivation to benefit you. It isn't good for those beings to do that. Trust me, I, we all know that. We are all not about trying to create more negative karma in the world by other people doing harmful things. But as long as they're going to do it, better for the, me with an open heart to receive all of that than someone who's going to respond in kind with you know, more anger, more resentment, further complicate all the suffering in the world. So again, these are shifts in attitude. And as I mentioned earlier, and I'll be picking up this book again a little bit later today, for some teachings that come out of this, but this is a, a wonderful way to reinforce what we're studying here, uh, Rinpoche's teachings on bodhisattva attitude. The first part of it goes into some other practices, but there's a whole chapter on bodhisattva attitude uh, and goes through these verses and really helps to articulate um, strongly how we practice this, how we actually shift our minds in that direction. Okay, any other comments then? Okay, so the last bit that we did here, let's go ahead and just read these 15b through 17 because we went through them at the very end of class. I didn't say a whole lot, but I do want to just touch on them briefly and then move on. Uh, perhaps after the break, we'll move on then to um, verse 18. Whenever any sentient being encounters me, may it never be meaningless for them and always be meaningful. Whenever someone has an angry or devotional thought arise, just by looking at me, may that attitude alone become a cause that always accomplishes all the temporary and ultimate purposes of that being. Whenever others criticize me with their speech, harm me with their bodies, or likewise insult me with behind my back, may all of them have the fortune to achieve great enlightenment. So as it says in that little box of italics in the center of that page 12, um, these are three verses that include kind of first praying for virtues to become causes that do not go to waste by um, being of only benefit to others, uh, praying for ourselves to be only a benefit to others. Secondly, praying for others' attitudes to become causes that don't go to waste. And then third, for others' actions to become causes that do not go to waste. So 15b, that second part of 15, is all about that I want myself to only be a benefit to others. To, you know, whenever anybody encounters me, even if it's somebody who, you know, thinks that what I just did on the road was not, you know, great, and they start honking their horn angrily at me and get all red-faced as they pass me or something, even if they do that, may it be meaningful for them. May it be something that will help them in some positive way. The second one is the idea of their attitudes. Whatever attitude they have, they can be angry at me, totally upset at me, red-faced at me, or they can be, oh, aren't you most kind, Don? Aren't you so wonderful? They can do all this, you know, kind of praising you and being very devotional towards you. Whatever they do to you, whatever attitude they have, may it not go to waste. May it only be a benefit to them again. May that become a cause that always accomplishes all their temporary and ultimate purposes whatever that being wants, whatever they need, whatever happiness they, they desire, temporal or ultimate, may they have it by virtue of whatever attitude they've had towards me. The third one is their actions. So we did the attitudes, now it's their actions. If they criticize us with their speech, harm us with their bodies, or insult us behind our back, anything else, I mean, Phil, <laughs> there's a myriad other things that beings could do that would be of harm. Because of those actions towards me, may all of them have the fortune to achieve great enlightenment. May they be able to achieve enlightenment by virtue of that. Of course, it's, these are outrageous thoughts, right? Again, and, and it, it's not that people do achieve enlightenment through being angry at other people. That's not the point. But it's a bit of what I was just explaining around Lama Zopa. It's kind of like, even in the space of somebody being really angry, may it only become the cause to help them eventually to find their own soft spot, to find their own heart, to be able to develop their own qualities, to eventually become enlightened. 
We want all of our engagements with other beings, whatever they might be, encounters, uh, to be a benefit to them and never to be of any harm. Of course, we have to have done the work ahead of time to reduce our own delusions, right? That's why this is, this is high-level practice. You know, recalling our three levels of the path to enlightenment, the first level is getting a bit more control over our physical and verbal actions. The second level is getting a lot more control over our minds so we can be free of all the delusions that are plaguing us. And then the third level is to extend out the compassionate wish to benefit others through all of this work, to see that we really ideally want to help them. This is that level. So we have to have done some work on our own delusions, right? That's why we went through the verses that encapsulate those three levels of the stages of the path earlier, because we have to have control over our own anger so that when we encounter somebody who is angry, we don't fall prey to that mindset. mindset. Instead, we have the willingness to have our heart open towards them, to wish them well in the space of whatever it is that they're doing towards us. So this requires a lot of work to be this wish fulfilling for others to be this kind of source of joy and happiness for others. But it's uh, definitely the goal. It's definitely what we're heading towards. A Buddha, of course, has removed anything that will obscure their minds, that will have any chance that these negative states will arise. And so they can be completely positive towards others. They can be a source of well-being for them. So, so let's go and take our break. I think it's 11. So we were talking earlier and why, where your name came up, just so you know, I mean, maybe someone already told you, but I was reading from Pema Chodron's commentary on these verses that Rinpoche has been encouraging us to, to meditate on as part of our daily practice. And there's this idea of if we've, if we've um, given our body to others, then whatever they do to us, that's up to them. You know, we're just going to, um, you know, allow them to do that and, you know, be used in a sense. And uh, Pema Chodron, I'll read this again. I think it's really quite nice when she says, when I first read these verses, I was appalled. I didn't want to consider going this far, nor did I feel it was wise to do so. From a Western perspective, this advice seems to feed right into the self-loathing so prevalent in our culture. But knowing that Chanti Deva's intention is always to support and encourage us, I looked past my initial aversion and discovered the wisdom of his words. And this is where you came up. This, I realized, was the approach of the civil rights workers. In order to benefit not only African Americans, but also their oppressors, they were willing to put their bodies and feelings on the line. For the greater good, they entered into dangerous situations. Being the butt of every mockery was the least of it. They knew they would be beaten, insulted, and perhaps killed. This is an example of bodhisattva wisdom and courage. Yet these were just ordinary people, ordinary people who had given birth to the Bodhi heart. And you had some experience with that. I don't know if you want to speak to it, but I just, I said, if you were here, perhaps you could. <laughs> slowly, slowly. <laughs> so yeah, sometimes we don't do it for the oppressors, for the people who were, you know, on the other side of the fence that we were, because again, we do deal with that reality that there are times when people are definitely on the wrong side of history, as they say, and doing things that are definitely against human rights. It's hard to have compassion for them in those cases. But ideally, that would be the best attitude to bring into it. But nonetheless, what she's speaking to is very true. I mean, people did still have that courage and conviction to travel all the way from you know the many states into the South to do this type of work um, with very little regard for their own welfare. Yeah because they knew that the cause was more important. And that's what, again, we're trying to emphasize in these types of practices. The cause here is the enlightenment of all beings. It's a, <laughs> a huge cause, but it's something we were trying to stay dedicated to all the time. And so when that's the cause, well, then we do whatever needs to be done in terms of um, uh, enduring these various uh, harms that you know, fall upon us and so on. It's hard practice. This is really, really tough stuff. But slowly, slowly, as you know, Lama Yeshe used to say, according to Venerable Rabina, she quotes him all the time saying that. So let's go on then to, we're entering into this kind of interesting part, and this won't, won't take us, maybe we'll certainly be able to finish these verses today, I imagine, because um, this really doesn't, uh, uh, it's the same sort of thought that gets perpetuated in these remaining verses from 18 all the way to, um, we skip over then to a verse from the 10th chapter, uh, verse 55. But what we're doing here in terms of this, um, I didn't bring in it in with me today. I somehow forgot it. But 
Geshe Yeshe Topten, he did a commentary on Shanti Deva's text as well. Uh, he was a teacher who taught in Italy, actually, at the same center where I studied, but he uh, had taught there years before I was there. Um, and he passed away some years ago. But his commentary on it, he says, what are these verses? Why, why, why do bodhisattvas want to recite these types of verses of may I be this, may I be that, may I become, we even had that already a little bit, right, of becoming wish fulfilling for others. He says this is to enlarge the, the kind of vision and scope of bodhisattvas so that they have this kind of expansion once more of not just their heart, but even of the, the intention behind that. Um, so there is this kind of, and this is according to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, uh, Geshe Yeshe Topten shared this. I wish I had it in front of me. I'm sorry, I forgot to bring it in. But the, the intention behind these types of verses are to think big in a sense, right? We often think quite small of ourselves. We always think, poor little me, what can I possibly do? How can I make a change in the world and so on? These are about thinking the biggest that you can. Remember last week I talked about how bodhisattvas often engage in thoughts that are in a bit, in a way, in a word, unrealistic, right? You know, they're not really in reality what we can do. I can't become all these various things for others right now, but it's the thought of moving in that direction. Now, when you do become a Buddha, and I've talked about this previously as well, it's said that you can manifest in whatever way is beneficial for beings according to their karma. So all these things that we're saying do have some resonance in the final state of enlightenment. But for us right now to make these prayers, it's as his holiness said just to keep enlarging our minds so that we think bigger and bigger and bigger i think that we could possibly become this huge source of welfare for others so let's look at verse 18 let's just read that one first and again i won't have a lot to say about most of these verses and may even go on to start talking about the next part of this practice but may i be a savior for those who lack a savior a guide for all the beings who enter a road a boat, a ship, and a bridge for those who wish to cross the water. So, you know, this is, again, starts off, I mean, this makes sense, you know, a savior for those who like it. We use this word savior sometimes to refer to uh, the Buddha or our, our gurus and so on. But there aren't, it's not like I grew up Catholic and so savior was, you know, our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, you know. So it was that kind of mentality of somebody who's going to die for your sins and save you from eternal damnation through that act or whatever. It's an act on their part that saves you without you having to do much more than kind of having faith in that and following the Christian path to some degree. But in Buddhism, savior isn't quite the same thing. You know, a savior is somebody who teaches us teaches us the path of salvation, who gives us the opportunity to practice that and to support us in that uh, development of our, our minds and hearts. But nonetheless, we want to be a savior in whatever way we can for those who don't have one. We want to be a guide for all beings who are entering a road, a path, whatever the case might be. These last ones start to get into all these material things that we could be. May I become a boat, a ship, a bridge for those who wish to cross over water. You know, there's lots of ways that we could be a benefit to others. And this is just about enlarging that capacity. Lama Zopa had an interesting comment here when he was talking about this, because of this strong wish that bodhisattvas are making, have made, will make, and of course the Buddhas who are enacting all of that, we never know who it is that we're meeting. I've mentioned this before, right? All of you could be Buddhas for all I know. I have no idea. You could all be manifesting as ordinary people coming to class here. So. I can get enlightened by teaching the Dharma. You know? Sorry, I'm taking so long, but you know, it's just how long it takes. <laughs> so I don't know who, I don't, we don't know anyone's, you know, level of, a, of accomplishment or realization, right? So he says here, when we are in trouble and somebody comes along and helps us, I think that that person could be a manifestation of a bodhisattva or a Buddha in ordinary form. That this happens is the result of our past good karma. So, you know, each of you might think about, was there a time in your life where something was challenging was going on and maybe some stranger came out of nowhere and helped you with something and then kind of disappeared or whatever? I had one incident like that. And again, I don't think it's due to my own past karma, maybe just due to whoever, whatever conditions, but 
there was one time, um, I'll explain that situation, but I'll open it up if others want to talk about this. But I was um, delivering meals for Project Open Hand in San Francisco, which was to people with AIDS who were taking meals to their homes. And the one night that I came, I usually had two people in the car, one to stay with the car and the other one to take the meals up. And so I, my partner wasn't there to do the, the delivery. So I had to do all the deliveries on my own. And we had new houses on the route that happened to be in what were called the Dakota projects, which are up on the top of Paterno Hill. And um, I'd never been in the projects before. I mean, <laughs> who goes wandering into the projects in San Francisco, you know? And so I parked the car and I got the meal and I start looking for the address. And of course, wandering around the projects, trying to figure out where the address is. And all of a sudden, this African-American woman came out of the dark or something. She said, can I help you? Is there something you need here? And I said, yeah, I'm trying to deliver this meal. And she asked a bit about the, the meal service and what it was. And of course, I couldn't talk about it being around AIDS, HIV, what have you, because you don't want to uh, betray the trust of uh, the people who are receiving those services. But she kind of guided me to the right, ad, right door and I knocked on the door and delivered the meal and then you know, said goodbye to her and left. And who knows? I mean, I was really grateful for her. That's all I can say, because I was going into territory that I really didn't know what was going to happen. And this being came out of the dark and helped me. So, so I don't know if anyone else has any interesting experiences like that, but I found it curious that Rinpoche put that in here, you know, that we don't know how bodhisattvas, Buddhas, whoever, that story I told you about Vinny Ferraro, I think that homeless person was a Buddha or bodhisattva manifesting in a way that they knew that the, the time was ripe for Vinny to have that crack in his hardened heart and for all of that to open up. Yeah, Mary. I have a quick one. Um, I was in, when I was living in Santa Fe the first time in 2004, I had another Buddha dog named Tora. We were hiking someplace, my husband and I, and we came down the mountain too late and we were locked in where you can't get out. Mm -hmm. And we lived actually right over here. Mm -hmm. So we didn't know what we, we were gonna do. So we had our dog and we were walking and this guy pulled over, you know, we got out of the park, we were walking, trying to walk home. And this guy pulled over with a car that was barely, barely moving, um, said, you need a ride. So of course we did. And inside his cart was just trash and his tank was on almost on empty. He brought us home, which was great. And I asked him his name because I wanted to send him 20 bucks. And of course I didn't have anything. And his name was Angel. <laughs> wow. Well, guided by an angel. Wow. <laughs> so again, I, you know, don't feel, don't feel like cheated if you haven't had this experience in your life. I mean, or like, oh my God, I didn't create that kind of karma. And I you know whatever. I mean, it's again, it, who knows what's going on is the point that we're making here. We don't know. We, we like to take everything on the surface and recall that again, appearance is one thing. Reality can be something very different. And so we don't know who's a highly realized being or who isn't. And so it's best to treat all beings with respect because of that, you know, and to recognize that every encounter we have with another being can become very precious and very powerful in our life and hopefully in theirs as well. But this verse is really about, may I be that? May I be able to guide people who need, you know, tr who are in trouble and need some assistance? Yeah. I'm always just really um, awed by the people who do this for a living, right? You know, or who volunteer for that. Uh, one of the organizations I like to um, give money to is um, Doctors Without Borders because they go to war-torn places and places of great suffering and, and provide you know, what needs to be done in terms of uh, life-saving um, uh, assistance, uh, medical assistance and what have you. So try to generate that type of thought when you have this. I mean, read this first. You go, may I become that? May I become somebody who goes to all those places and helps people in whatever way they need to? Okay, then let's go on to verse 19. May I be an island for those who seek the safe shore of an island, a light for those who want a light, bedding for those who wish for bedding, and for all beings who desire a servant, may I become a servant of them all. So Rinpoche goes right to that last line and he says, usually you don't want others to use you as their servant. You think of that as something bad and instead want others to become your servants. <laughs> but here the practice is to want to become, be a servant of others. As your goal is to bring happiness to others, this attitude becomes a cause of enlightenment. So again, more of a continuation of the same theme of wh whoever is in need, 
whoever needs something, be it an island, a light, bedding, a servant, may I fulfill that need? May I be wish fulfilling in these ways? Again, and, and it, I'm sure Master Shantideva could have gone on to write numerous verses that were about all the various things that we could be for others. Yeah. Just use your imagination again when you're reciting this to think of uh, becoming wish fulfilling, helping to address the needs of all beings in whatever way uh, they might have those. Any comments on any of these verses so far? Let's continue on with number 20. May I be a wish granting jewel and a wish fulfilling vase giving rise to whatever is desired, such as food and clothing, powerful mantra accomplishing the action of pacification, increase and so forth, great medicine curing every disease sickness, a wish fulfilling tree satisfying every need and a wish granting cow for all beings. So we get this wish granting cow in this verse. You've never heard of this cow before. Um, Rinpoche goes on to explain all of these. You know, wish granting jewel came up before, right? This is this idea of, again, these are somewhat mythical, but I guess there may be realms where these things exist. I don't know. Again, we all have limited knowledge in terms of what exists in uh, other worlds. We may, may not see them in this world, but the idea of a wish granting jewel is that you take it from, I think they're in the sea and you take them out and you clean them and put them on a post, a flagpole on like the full moon day of a month and do all these rituals around it and you're able to get whatever you want from it in terms of material things it's like again that has that capacity um, so he says Rinpoche says this happens mainly due to your merits but it, it is also due to the wish granting jewel itself like this whatever others wish for may they immediately get it from you so we saw a lot of things being added on to that, as well as the, the wish fulfilling vase, but giving rise to whatever is desired. Rinpoche says, you know, food, clothing, and so on, whatever it is that we need, that beings need, may they gain it from us instantly. May we be wish fulfilling in, in that way. The wish fulfilling vase, he says, is pretty much the same as a wealth vase. Uh, some centers actually have um, done the rituals around creating a wealth face. It's a really powerful way to um, kind of create the causes for wealth. But once more, recognizing that it doesn't just come from some object out there, it comes from the karma of the beings who are involved in that. But um, anyway, it's supposed to bring success, wealth, and so forth. By becoming such a vase, all your wishes are immediately fulfilled. So this is the idea we want to do that for others, become wish fulfilling in that way. The mantras, it talked about powerful mantra in the verse too, right? Um, uh, it said, again, mantras, many of you may have some hesitation around mantras. Mantras are said to be the vocalization of the energy of that Buddha, or if they're given by Buddha Shakyamuni, a lot of the mantras we're going to see later in this um, uh, practice uh, are mantras that the Buddha gave that are to help us. They're the embodiment of that Buddha in speech. And so many of you do use mantra, and when you actualize mantra, he says, it's then very easy to achieve success in the four actions of pacification, increase, uh, control, and wrath. These four actions are brought up very frequently in the tantric teachings, but they're kind of ways that you can have more powerful manifestations in the world uh, to pacify what needs to be pacified, increase things, control, and then of course, a wrathful force when needed, you know, when there are very powerful things that are coming at you to be able to meet them with an equal power. But of course, it's a compassionate motivation behind that. So again, this is what we want to be for others, like a powerful mantra that accomplishes all these actions for them. The great medicine is, we all know of Medicine Buddha, right? We do the Puja Medicine Buddha here, and there's the practice on Tuesday nights sometimes with Charmaine. The medicine Buddha's in the Tonka right there above between James and Phyllis on the wall. And in his right hand, he's holding the stem of an Aurora plant. The Aurora plant is said to be this great medicine. He says, uh, the Aurora normally used uh, in Tibetan medicine is ordinary Aurora. But the best Aurora is the one that even just by wearing it prevents you from getting a disease or if you already have a disease, causes it to go away. And he actually says in Tashi Lumpo Monastery in Tibet, I had the good fortune of going there, but I didn't know this when I went there. I was there in 1994, but this type of Aurora is a relic at the heart of a four-story Maitreya Buddha statue. And it said that sickness is healed by standing near the heart for a little while, but I don't know. But this is this idea. May I become this great medicine for others that cures every sickness? Yeah. 
uh, wish fulfilling trees uh, in a pure land. These wish fulfilling trees grant whatever you pray for, similar to the jewels and the um, uh, what was the other thing we saw the vase. Uh, which, and then it's the particular enjoyment of the people of the northern continent, which is said to be one of the uh, various, you know, how we, in our, when we did the mandala offering at the beginning, we said Mount Meru, four continents. Mm -hmm. It's one of the four continents, the northern one. <laughs> and, and the northern comp continent, they have this wish granting cow, apparently. I don't know. This cow not only continuously gives milk, but the different parts of its body are made of jewels, and its tail is a wish granting tree. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Again, never seen such things, but you know, why not? You know, again, there can be different karma in different realms. Keep that in mind too. You know, this is a strange phenomenon, but you know, we get so embedded in like our view and our way of looking at things on the basis of what happens in this world that what we call magic or miracles or things that go beyond that we get quite astounded by, right? But that could be quite ordinary in other worlds where the karma is so much better. You know, where beings have that, and that's why they're born into such realms and so on. So, so I don't know. I, the, the, again, the purpose behind that verse is so that we can just have this concept of being wish fulfilling in whatever way. Let's go on then to verse 21 and 22. We'll read these two together. Like the four great elements, the earth and so forth, and like the sky, may I always be a means of living in every way for the innumerable sentient beings. Likewise, may I be a means of living at all times and in all ways for the realms of sentient beings equaling the extent of space until they all attain the sorrowless state. So this uses the analogy of like being the, the very elements of which our material world is composed and you know, being that for others, being earth, uh, obviously, Earth, as Rinpoche points out, points out, is very useful in our world. You know, it's the field of dirt that we are able to grow crops in and so on, to plant flowers for our enjoyment. The Earth is also used, he says, as the base for airports, train stations, roads, vehicles, factories, shops, monasteries, houses, gardens, whatever. I mean, we need the Earth. We need that kind of element. Pray that you may be used in many ways like the Earth for sentient beings for their happiness. Um, water, of course, uh, isn't mentioned here, uh, just as the earth and so forth, but water is one of the other elements. Um, also used by sentient beings in so many different ways for their happiness, not only to quench their thirst, but to water the crops. We use water for enjoyment, uh, for travel, boats, ships, and so on. Pray for yourself to be used like water by sentient beings in all kinds of ways for their happiness. Fire, course in the winter here you know fire is a nice thing right in the summer maybe fire you know what they're dealing with in Australia has a dangerous component to it but may we be the fire that warms in the dark in the dark of cold and so on um, may uh, we be able to be the fire that allows beings to cook to transform food into delicious meals and so on all of that um, you know pray for yourself Rinpoche says to be used like fire by sentient beings uh, wind or air energy, you know, that's the other element, is also used by sentient beings in many different ways. Uh, air conditioning and fans when it's hot. Um, air is obviously contains the oxygen by which we breathe and so on, you know, and it even contains the carbon dioxide that then goes to the plants and so on. I mean, there's so much involved in air. May we be air for others, wind for others uh, in the same way, benefit them. And then sky is mentioned a little separately, like the sky. Rinpoche says the sky is also used in so many different ways for the happiness of sentient beings, such as for traveling and you know, flying through the sky and so on. Birds do that and what have you, I don't know. But the idea here, once more, is pray for your life to be used, like the sky, like the earth, all the other elements, for the happiness of others, be used by them in that way. So we can make those sorts of prayers. And then it says, likewise, may I be a means of living at all times and in all ways for the realms of sentient beings. So the idea is here is, is may I become that for others as well, so support them, sustain them in their, in their lives. So I found it kind of interesting. Rinpoche says, if you're really pressed for time, which some of us may have days where we get up and we go, oh my gosh, I can't possibly recite all of this. The, the verses that he suggests in this book to do are 20 through 22. You know, this idea of continuing that theme of being wish fulfilling, being the support for others, be the means of living for them, whatever. 
So you're certainly, again, welcome to shorten this to just 20 through 22 if you're finding that it's hard to have the time to recite all of this. And then we come across in the final page there. Let me see if I can find my page that goes with that. It's not on the other side there. Verse 55. Many of you will recognize verse 55. It's in the prayer that we are doing at the end of class on Sundays now. I can't find my sheet. Um, it's uh, a prayer that His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, really uh, embraces as a way to enlarge on this bodhisattva mo uh, motivation. I think I mentioned this previously, you know, when we talked about last week's class, I guess, when we talked about these different motivations of courage that the bodhisattva can have, uh, the, the uh, ruler-like, the captain, ship captain-like, and the um, shepherd-like. And so this is kind of embodying that shepherd-like courage that's whereas a shepherd will wait and to go and retire and, and have the comfort of home at the end of the day will wait to do that until all the sheep are you know safely in the pen and taken care of and not at any danger then retire it's the same kind of concept that's embodied in this verse of like i will endure whatever suffering needs to be endured i will stay in samsara and continue to experience whatever needs to be experienced until every single being is liberated, until every being is free. Again, it, with that type of motivation, it said you become enlightened even quicker. You can never really accomplish that because it's impossible for you to get all beings into enlightenment and then attain enlightenment yourself. We all know it actually happens in the ruler-like way, that you have to become the ruler, you have to become somebody qualified to then be able to benefit others to the greatest degree. So nonetheless, this verse, verse 55 from chapter 10, is a really powerful way of enlarging that type of selfless heart that is, you know, I'm going to be here as long as it takes. So let's read that verse together. As long as space remains, as long as transmigratory beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the suffering of transmigratory beings. Of course, it also we can read it as feeding into what the, the Buddhas are able to accomplish because by attaining that state of enlightenment, they do hang out in their own way. I mean, albeit Buddhas have extracted themselves from uh, the suffering of the world, but they still stay engaged in the suffering of the world in whatever form is necessary to help others. So we can see it in that light as well, but it's in my mind, it's really to increase that kind of intention to endure whatever it takes to help others, to be a benefit to others, to serve them. So His Holiness the Dalai Lama um, Rinpoche says often asks people to recite these holy words of the Bodhisattva Shantideva after he gives the Bodhisattva vows. And he even has, when he does the aspirational vows, there is a way that you take an aspirational commitment to do Bodhicitta prior to taking the vows. This is the third verse that he has you recite. The first verse is, I think, with the wish to benefit all sentient beings, I go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I am enlightened. Enthused by wisdom and compassion, today in the presence of the Buddha, I generate the mind of uh, pure awakening for as long as space exists and as long as sentient beings remain. Until then, may I too abide to dispel the miseries of the world. Anyway, that's my version that I use. It's a little different than what we have here, but... But it's nice to take that kind of aspirational every day kind of making this aspiration that we're going to, we're, we're in it for the long haul, you know, folks, we're in it for as long as it takes. Uh, and that is the one thing that we have to keep in mind that we have to have that long-term mentality. You know, we do, we did touch on the tantric component of the Buddhist teachings when we went through the initial Lam Rim prayers. And it is nice to know that Tantra is there to help you to get to enlightenment even more quickly. But recall the motivation for that wasn't because I can't stand to be here any longer and I need to get enlightened as quickly as possible. It's because others are suffering and we can't bear the thought that they continue to suffer while we remain unenlightened. So we have to generate that long-term view that feeds into that, that says, however long it takes, I'm dedicated to it. I've shared this before, but I like sharing things again because they refresh my memory. <laughs> I hope you enjoy hearing them again. But when I, when I saw His Holiness the Dalai Lama, did I mention this last week, the story of Milarepa? No, okay. Um, when I went to see His Holiness the Dalai Lama in 1997, I think it was, it was teachings on Nagarjuna's precious garland in um, UCLA in their huge sports arena auditorium, whatever, it was like filled. I don't know if anyone else in the room was at those teachings. They were pretty incredible. 
he opens the, he opens it up to questions generally. And in this case, he got a question from somebody in the audience who said, what is the quickest, easiest way to become enlightened? <laughs> uh, and His Holiness first was kind of like a bit admonishing, like going, why is, why is, why is everybody thinking quickest, you know, easiest? Blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden he stopped and, and he got really silent. And you could tell that he was going into a very deep space and the entire place got silent. You know, they say you could hear a pin drop, well, even in this big space, I bet you could hear a pin drop. Because everybody was just like, oh my gosh, what's going on? And His Holiness was, was started crying, started weeping. And then he kind of came up out of this eventually and he started talking to this translator to Tupton Jimpa. And he essentially said, this reminded him of the story of Milarepa. Milarepa, at the end of his life, many of you know who Milarepa is, this great Tibetan saint who had a pretty despicable past but came through the guidance of his teacher Marpa and so on, was able to achieve these great realizations. Towards the end of his life, Milarepa's disciples were invited to come on this one morning uh, Milarepa had told them, Anna, I want to give you a teaching and, you know, very special teaching, please come. And of course, they're all talking about it and saying, oh, wow, I wonder, he's going to give us like the real thing, the real deal, the way to get, you know, <laughs> the secret, you know. And so they show up that morning and all that Milarepa does is he gets up off of his cushion, he stands up and he reveals his backside that's completely calloused from all the sitting that he's had to do. Oh. That's the lesson, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's the secret. You know? But you know, His Holiness, this like breaks His Holiness's heart when he hears this in some way, because he sees that people don't have the willingness to do the work then. You know, if you're sitting there and saying, what's the quickest, easiest way? We have that mentality in the West, right? We always want everything to be quick, fast, and everything needs to be faster, faster, faster internet connection, faster this, faster that, you know? And it's crazy, right? Because this is something that takes time. It takes a dedicated energy day in and day out. So His Holiness was just, don't say, don't think quickest, shortest, you know, whatever. He says, think long-term, think long-term. And I think we all have to have that and remind ourselves of that every day, that we're just doing, you know, and there's that, that analogy of like putting another drop of water in the bucket. Well, every drop of water helps to fill the bucket, right? You're gonna, it's going to get full eventually. You like to think it's only the last drop that actually takes it to the rim. But every drop adds to the fullness of the bucket. Every day of our dedication and practice of these principles in our lives adds to the result of enlightenment. So anyway, I love this verse. And of course, you know, we'll be reading it shortly as part of the dedication prayers. But it really does embody in my mind that long-term perspective and that and commitment and courage that it takes to be involved in all of this for as long as you know, it's going to take. It's hard to be in samsara. I mean, we all know that. I mean, we come to the Buddha's teachings on Saturdays. We've been going through the module of discovering Buddhism on samsara and nirvana. And you start waking yourself up to that reality. You go, God, you know, how much longer can I deal with this? Been there, done that forever. I mean, <laughs> so, but that impetus to get yourself out of it is one step, one way of approaching it, but to then use it as a mirror to say, oh, this is how everyone else is suffering. I have to be committed to their welfare as well. And it's going to take a lot of energy and time to get to this result. But I just have to keep doing it. Just have to keep getting up every day and do the work. So um, trying to give a pep talk, maybe it's not coming off that way. <laughs> <laughs> So I'd like to go through this little bit that's at the end of that page 14 after this verse. Uh, Tony brought this up last time because he thought it was really eye-opening eye to him in terms of his not seeing the wisdom of some of those other practices that we talked about of enduring the criticism and the beating and whatever. Gampopa, Melarepa's heart disciple said, after waking from sleep and before you get out of bed, think, today I'm going to use my body, speech, and mind. These are what we call the three doors in virtue for sentient beings. It is so important to generate this precious thought of bodhicitta, the ultimate good heart. Whatever you do that day is then done with bodhicitta. So everything then becomes virtue and the cause of enlightenment. If your motivation is wrong, everything then becomes negative karma and a cause of the evil gone realms, you know, cause of potentially losing this opportunity that we currently possess and not gaining it again for some time, you know. 
So when you then go to sleep at night, dedicate all your actions of body, speech, and mind for sentient beings. This is also extremely important. It said that without difficulties, this becomes the path to the Dharmakaya. He says without difficulties, but I mean, again, it's all relative. It's, you know, difficulties over time don't become that. They become kind of the red badge of courage kind of idea. You know, they become something that we endure because we know it's getting us to the result that we want to achieve. So uh, one thing I wanted to touch on before we end today, we got about 12 minutes and I mentioned that I was going to pick this up later or later in today's class to highlight what are called the bodhicitta mindfulness exercises. And there even is a little pamphlet. I brought in uh, one copy of it um, that is called Cultivating Mindfulness of Bodhicitta in Daily Activities. You can download this from the FPMT if you're interested in it. It's Rinpoche's way of giving us advice about how to practice bodhicitta mindfulness throughout our day. It's one thing to do these at the beginning of your day, and this is what the emphasis of this course is, right? Is to have your, your start your day off right, uh, with on the right foot, with everything in line in terms of your motivation. But if we go through our day and we don't have a recollection of bodhicitta, we're gonna miss a lot of opportunities to create unbelievable merit and to enlarge on that motivation. Now, as Rinpoche was saying, you know, it's best not to, you know, engage in negative things, you know, certainly, the degree to which we uh, engage in angry minds, uh, attached, desirous minds, all of that, that's going to be problematic. But there's a lot of things we do during our day that we're not really attached or having any kind of strong emotion, but they're just normal things that we do that are mundane activities. And that's the emphasis of a lot of these practices. So another example of this, this was a much earlier version, is in your prayer book. So let's go to the prayer book on page 200 and... 11, 10, 9, something like that, 209. 209 of the prayer book. Then it was called, when we first put the prayer books together, FPMT, they called it Thought Training for Everyday Practice. But the words there, I mean, it's very similar in terms of this. This has just got a few more things that we can do on it and a little bit more commentary and what have you. But at the very beginning there, it says, with all actions, we should cause bodhicitta to arise in our minds as in the following examples. When you go into a temple or a room, we should think with bodhicitta, may all mother sentient beings be led into the city of nirvana. I am now leading them just as I enter this place. Now that's a lot of words. Shorten it to whatever works for you. You don't have to say the exact words in your own mind. But when you go into a room, how many times do we go in and out of rooms in a day? <laughs> a lot, right? You know, wherever you're doing you're going to do this activity a lot. How many of those times do you bring a bodhicitta motivation to it? Maybe zero right now. But the idea is, is if you can start to bring that bodhicitta motivation into half of your times you go into a room, well, then how wonderful. When you come out of the room, have the bodhicitta thought, may all sentient beings be released from the samsaric prison. As I now leave this room, I am leading them out. You know, again, read through these sorts of things. You can, you know, certainly take a look at the prayer book, but they are also a number of them in Bodhicitta Mindfulness, or I'm sorry, Bodhisattva Attitude in the Bodhicitta, Bodhicitta Mindfulness uh, chapter of this. And you can go through and pick the ones that you'd like to work with. Don't start with all of them. You're going to go crazy if you say, I'm going to practice all what four pages of this every day. You're not going to, it's not going to stick and then you're going to get discouraged. Take one maybe one that kind of sees, seems like something that you could use and begin to work with that. Um, so let me see a few others at the bottom of that page, at least to the version of the prayer book I have, when washing ourselves, we cause bodhicitta to arise thinking, may all the stains of sentient beings' delusions be washed away. This can be when you wash your face, wash your body in the shower, bath, whatever. Um, when we sweep the next page, Think, may the dust of sentient beings hate, greed, and ignorance be purified, just as I am sweeping the dust away now. Whenever you're cleaning anything, you can think that you're cleaning away delusions of sentient beings. Not just your own delusions, but the, the delusions of all beings. Um, continues on, let's see, what are a few others? When we read a book, a lot of people like to read a book, right? Think, may all mother sentient beings be able to distinctly realize all the meanings of every word of the Buddha's extensive and profound teachings without confusion. As I read and understand the subject, I am making them fully realized. Of course, Rinpoche is assuming we're all reading Dharma books, but. <laughs> <laughs> but even if you're reading, you know, some trashy novel or something, you know. <laughs> 
think that by virtue of your sitting down and reading that, may it become the cause for all beings to read and understand the Dharma. Why not? I mean, again, try not to have too many deluded things that you're trying to convert, but even those deluded things. I'll tell the story that I uh, have shared before about Venerable Rabina the one time when she was here. It was uh, when Downton Abbey used to be on PBS, and I was, I was a big Downton Abbey fan. I saw the film. The film was okay, but anyway. <laughs> and so it was the end of the teachings was coming up, and we were talking about joyous effort and our kind of pursuing the path. And there's one of the powers that we need to have to keep our energy going. And that's called relinquishment, which means essentially setting aside the work to replenish our energy. And I was talking about how this can be a bit of a slippery slope because I said, here I am going through this whole wonderful weekend with you, Venerable Rabina, and all I want to do is go home and watch Downton Abbey tonight. <laughs> you know, And she said, well, if you're going to watch Downton Abbey, you're going to watch it with Bodhicitta or you're not going to watch it at all. <laughs> So this is what we have to do. It's like, even if we're going to sit down and watch a TV show or go to the movies or go for a walk out in nature, you do it with bodhicitta. You do it with the, the mindset that may this too become a cause for benefiting others. Just as I'm able to sit down and relax and, you know, be able to have some space in my mind, may they have the space in their mind that helps them to develop their qualities and so on. But do it with bodhicitta. So let me go through just uh, one or two more. Maybe go to page 212. Um, when we talk about or discuss the Dharma, think may all sentient beings be able to understand all the words in the practice of bodhicitta, extinguishing each and every doubtful and unrealized mind as soon as it arises. Again, that's a lot of words, but just by developing your own understanding through talking, discussing the Dharma and so on, think about others being able to benefit from that. Then the next one, which is one that is also useful to be in here, when we excrete, think may all sentient beings' delusions and mental defilements be removed just as this. By the way, there was a passage earlier in here where um, Rinpoche says, you know, that we want to be this whole verse around wanting to be used by others or become something useful for others. He says here on page 107, there's no mention of being a toilet. Of course, it would be many thousands of pages if everything was mentioned. So I think Shantideva abbreviated. But if you want, you can pray to be a bathroom for those who need one. <laughs> Especially when you go to Tibet, most of the time there is no toilet and you have to go outside to the free bathroom. <laughs> Anyway, here we are training our minds in the bodhisattva attitude. Therefore, even if it is not mentioned here, you can pray to become absolutely anything that sentient beings need. So anyway, back to this verse, which has, you know, this little practice. That's also a time when, again, it's just wasted time otherwise, right? You know, you go to the bathroom and nothing happens. And you just, that's done. You could use that time to generate some positive thoughts, right? Why not? I mean, it makes sense at some level because the more you become familiar with bodhicitta, throughout your day, the more that's going to be your default motivation, right? In everything you do. I didn't mention one of the car. When you get into a car and you're driving, you can think that you're taking all beings to the city of enlightenment and so on. I think that was another one in here. I don't know, maybe some of these he's added to, again, the original prayer book didn't have all of them um, that exist now, but. So any questions or comments on that practice? Be creative too, Victor. Yeah. That what? Oh, to tell a personal story. Wonderful. Just a personal experience. Uh huh. Me and my partner, we would travel a lot. We went to England, to London. And we one of the things we wanted to do was to see Karl Marx's grave site. Mm -hmm. So on you know, our trips, we decided on our first trip, so we didn't know where we were going, so we had to take a train, we had to ride, it was four o'clock. And we're rushing and rushing to try to find it because this room I really want to see it. Mm -hmm. So I asked a, an English man, I said, you know, I was in a rush, we want to see it. So I asked him, what's the quickest way to the cemetery? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I was honestly thinking about the race stop, and I'm not. And he said, I can tell you one way, really quick. Here's when I laughed. And he said, no, you have to go that way. And so we're walking away from the cemetery. I get chills just thinking about it. Uh -huh. So Israel and I were sadly leaving, and all of a sudden, this lady, old lady, came towards us. 
and he's dressed like a flapper, you know, like 1920, in the 20s. <laughs> and he told a stranger, she said, I know what you're looking for. You go over that way, and there's a, a gate, and there's a, a bush that's open, and you look through it, and you'll see Karl Marx waiting for you. Wow. And so we did. We walked uh -huh. away from her, and we both turned around, and she disappeared. <laughs> Interesting. It was really creepy, but it was amazing. She was absolutely right. We went in and we looked through the gate and there was Karl Marx playing. Uh, uh, so, and so interesting. The reason I said the queue is about Downton Abbey. The question about you know, uh, what's the quickest way to reach a right window with a guy telling you. <laughs> <laughs> So, so for those online, I apologize, I can't share that whole story, but thank you, Victor, for sharing that. So again, it was just a story, again, where we don't know who's coming to our aid in our various endeavors and things, you know, and it's nice to have that kind of openness to whatever, you know, but <laughs> poor Mani. Mani wants to share a story, I think. Um, any other comments before we close today? Yeah, Mark. Uh-huh. Um, I, I, I think there's a way where it's possible to um, perceive that for every drop in the bucket, there's a payoff. Yeah. And not in, you know, sure. three life studies down sure. the road. There really is a payoff. Yeah. Right, right in the moment, yeah. No, thanks for pointing that out, Mark. It's another important part of it. So again, those online, um, Mark was saying, yeah, it's not that we have to wait till the bucket's completely full for a payoff. With every drop, there's a payoff. With every drop, there's an in incremental increase in terms of our qualities, our well-being. I mean, absolutely. I mean, if, yeah, insights that we have, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. No, thanks for pointing out that. That's a good, nice, nice thought to end with. So shall we go to our dedication prayers? Go to page 246. 246 is where we have some more verses from Master Shanti Deva, these being verses of dedication that end with verse 55 that we just were discussing. Um, and uh, let's recite these today by first keeping in mind all those beings that we're dedicating for as well. Uh, we'll be, be sure to add on the list here that's right by the donation box the, um, any names of people that you want dedicated for in the puja today because we'll be sure to recite those names. We can think of those beings that we know who are experiencing obstacles or even parts of the world where there's great suffering due to the elements and so on. We can think about those who we know who are experiencing illness, who are dying or who have died recently and holding them in our hearts. We dedicate for them, but also for all beings as we recite these verses together. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food, May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Turn back a page. We'll begin with the uh, prayer that's on page 246.
page 245 paperclip there for His Holiness, and then we'll go to the prayer for Rinpoche that's on the other page. Before we recite these, though, it's good to bring to mind all the holy beings that we're dedicating this for, for their good health and long life. And we can think even, again, of all spiritual guides, even in other spiritual traditions, if they are helping others to find a path of practicing good morality, uh, having the good heart and so on, whatever they are helping them in regard to, uh, may these beings, these guides also have the benefits of what we've done here today, uh, have a good health, long lives, and may we and others continue to have guides in our lives. The wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, to the incomparably kind Tenzin Gyatso, I beseech, may all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjuna's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers, honoring the three jewels, Savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. Thank you all so much. In terms of the... Uh,